Hi, my name is Aaron Lacey, and I'm the co-chair of the higher education practice at Thompson Coburn LLP. And you are listening to Complaints of Sex Discrimination, which is uh, the second session in the four-part Title IX training series being brought to you by Thompson Coburn. If you don't know us, Thompson Coburn is a law firm. We have offices around the country, a little over 400 uh, attorneys, and uh, we have a higher education practice here at the firm, which means we have a group of individuals who spend all or most of their time serving institutions of higher education. Uh, today's presentation uh, is focused on the new Title IX rule and Hopefully, if you're watching it, you already have some idea of what that is. But just in case you don't, uh, the new Title IX rule took effect or will take effect rather uh, on August 1st of this year, 2024. We're recording this series in the uh, sort of halfway, second half of July of 2024. Um, this Title IX training series, as it says on your screen, is designed to provide foundational training to those individuals who help to administer this new Title IX process on their campuses, and that may include Title IX coordinators, investigators, adjudicators, advisors, and others. And actually, there are responsibles under uh, there are responsibilities under this new rule for everyone, uh, employees across your entire campus. Just want to make very clear, our Title IX training series that we did previously for 2020 is still available online. Uh, and this new, obviously, 2024 series is now available for you on YouTube. We also have additional materials that are going to be out there and available, including the slides from these presentations. So institutions of higher education, to be clear, are very welcome to use these videos as training. In fact, we hope you will. That's why we've created them here for you today. Uh, we're delighted for you to use the slides as well. Um, if you have any questions about the use of these materials, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, Scott Goldschmidt, or any of the other presenters you're going to see today, which includes Lee and Stephanie, and I'll talk about them in just a minute. Um, and the reason you might still need some custom training, by the way, and we are available to do that custom training, we do that for institutions across the United States, uh, there are two or three reasons, actually. I mean, the first is you're going to need some level of training on your specific policies that you develop to comply with the 2024 rule. This is foundational training. We're going to give you a lot of information about this new rule and what's required. We really are going to break it down across these four sessions. We also anticipate releasing two or three best practices video after this core four-part training series uh, hits the wire, but you're still going to need some training specifically on your policies and processes on your campus. You may also need to do additional training to take into account state or municipal laws uh, and considerations. And finally, there's already a lot of litigation out there. I mentioned this is the second half of July 2024 when we're recording this series. There are several lawsuits. There have been a couple of injunctions already granted. Some of those apply to different states. Some apply to schools that have certain students in attendance. So finally, you're going to need to take that into account and modify, accommodate your training um, just to, to understand and uh, take into account those various um, municipal laws, regulations, and lawsuits. Our training series is uh, presented in four parts. I mentioned a second ago. Uh, the first that we uh, should, hopefully you've already listened to it, is an introduction to the 2024 Title IV, uh, Title IX rule when we just sort of go over generally the scope of Title IX and the new rule uh, and what's changed and what's important for you to understand. That's the big picture. Um, today, we're really focused on complaints of sex discrimination on campus, and then we're going to have two more sessions, one on complaints of sex-based harassment that involves students, and then finally one on pregnancy and related conditions. Now, just in case that doesn't make sense, if you didn't see the first session uh, or you're already looking at this and you just don't remember and you're saying, well, what's the difference between a complaint of sex discrimination and a complaint of sex-based harassment involving a student? We have a graphic here that we tried to come up with that we hope is helpful. And you'll see if you look in the graphic, um, we like to think of it sort of generally as the obligation when you look at the Title IX regulations starts with this obligation to provide policies and procedures, right, that that account for any kind of sex discrimination that might be alleged or occur on your campus. And so this includes you know, designated into Title IX coordinator, um, having a grievance policy in general, adopting a non-discrimination policy and training and record keeping requirements, all those kinds of general obligations, right? But then under the new rule, even after you've sort of created that policy infrastructure, there are some very specific obligations you have when you actually receive a complaint of sex discrimination on campus. But keep in mind, sex discrimination is a big umbrella. That could be uh, an allegation that someone is being paid more than another person based on sex. That could be an allegation of sex discrimination in the context of athletics, right? 
But then there's this last bucket when you have an actual allegation of sex-based harassment involving a student. And in those cases, under the new rule, you have an even heightened level of process that you have to supply. So today we're focused sort of in this second bucket, right? Or the second circle here. We're going to talk about specifically the processes and procedures and considerations that come into play when you have a complaint of sex discrimination, but short of a complaint or allegation of sex-based harassment involving a student. So we're sort of in that middle space today. Um, we have four presenters. You've seen us already. Hopefully in the first session, you will see the same four and the uh, third and fourth sessions. It's a great group. Um, I mentioned earlier, my name is Aaron Lacey, and I'm the uh, co-chair, one of the co-chairs of the higher education practice at our law firm. Uh, I'm joined by my colleagues and friends. First, I'll say Scott Goldschmidt, who's another partner in the higher education practice. Uh, Scott spent almost a decade uh, in the general counsel office there at Catholic University in uh, Washington, D.C., and, and retired retired from that position as deputy general general counsel before he joined us. So he's been very much in house uh, and has worked through title nine and discrimination issues and human resources issues throughout his career. Um, Stephanie Fredman, an associate in our higher education practice also has extensive experience generally in human resources areas and discrimination law, but specifically with title nine. Stephanie also spent time uh, in house in both a K-12 and a post-secondary position prior to coming back to private practice. So, uh, again, has been on both sides of this, both from the in-house perspective and the private uh, practice perspective. And finally, the same is true for uh, Leah Northerner, who's joining us. I should say Leah's in our Dallas office. Stephanie is in St. Louis with me and Scott is over in Washington, D.C. So we're sort of coming to you from all over the United States today. Uh, and Leah also, in addition to spending much of her private practice career working on uh, Title IX and discrimination law matters, um, similarly has been in-house uh, at a charter school, I believe. Right, Leah? So has been all over the place and had a lot of experience managing this rule, again, from the in-house perspective. We think that's important because we know a lot of the folks watching this video, you know, it's one thing to know the law. It's another thing to actually then have to implement this new rule on campus and figure out how to sort of make it go, right? And that's a real challenge. Um, with all of that being said, I'll give you the quick syllabus. See what we did there, syllabus, because this is higher education. For the presentation today, we're going to start discussing what we mean by the complaint. Um, and then we're going to talk about the grievance process. And, and by that, you know, we mean the investigation, sort of review, et cetera, once a complaint has been received, those processes that have to be followed under the new rule. Talk briefly about appeals. And finally, about this concept of serving and partially, which is so critically important. With that, I will take a break here and turn it over, I believe, to Scott to uh, start us off on a discussion of the complaint. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, pleasure to be back uh, with you all again doing this um, in, uh, in, in 2024. So we thought we'd start off our discussion about complaints of sex discrimination um, with an explanation of what we mean by complaints. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. So if you remember from our initial, our, our first module, right, there's a difference between a report of sex discrimination and a complaint of sex discrimination. Now, again, a report of sex discrimination is just a notification to the school of possible sex discrimination or retaliation. It doesn't request the school to investigate, uh, but it could include supportive measures. That's different here from a defined term, which is the complaint. And as you see in the slide, complaint under the regulations means an oral or written request to the school that objectively can be understood as a request for the school to investigate and make a determination about alleged discrimination under Title IX. Now, this is different, right, from the 2020 version um, of this concept, the formal complaint that has to be written and signed. Uh, here, this is much broader, right? So any even an oral statement, as long as it can be objectively understood as a request to investigate and make a determination, counts as a complaint. So really important for both institutions, people administering the process, and your employees uh, of institutions to understand that this requirement has gotten a lot broader under this rule. Um, Scott, I, I know we have a couple of questions here. Um, one of the first questions, so who can make a complaint of uh, sex-based harassment? Yeah, great question. Uh, and this is actually specified in regulation. So another important concept to understand and kind of going back to the graphic that Aaron talked about in the beginning between sex discrimination and sex based harassment, there is a bifurcation between who can make a complaint of sex discrimination and who can make a complaint of sex based harassment, which again is a form of sex discrimination and could include 
quid pro quo, hostile environment, or clery crimes or, or adjacent specific offenses. When we're talking about that narrower subset, the, the sex-based harassment, the form, uh, the, the part of sex discrimination, uh, the people that can make complaints are a complainant, which is, is a defined term and basically means someone that's that has been uh, alleged to have been subject to the offensive conduct, or a legal representative of that individual. Um, a third bucket is the Title IX coordinator can make a complaint under plenary authority. We're gonna discuss in a few slides, but important to note that when we're talking about sex-based harassment, aside from the Title IX coordinator, people that have been subject to sex-based sex harassment or their legal representatives are the ones that can make complaints. So good. So in contrast, Scott, who can make a complaint of sex-based discrimination other than sex-based harassment? And, and again, it's so important to keep these concepts separate, right? Because it seems to me the whole framework of the new rule very much, uh, at least when it comes to complaints, like you constantly have to be thinking about whether you're inside this bucket of sex-based harassment or outside of the bucket and just in the sort of larger grouping of uh, sex discrimination. Is that fair? Exactly right. So those that can make, uh, when we're talking about the broader sex discrimination, other than sex-based harassment, it's those individuals we talked about, uh, but also just generally employees of the school or other people that were attempting to participate or participating in the education program or activity. So it doesn't have to be someone that's that's actually alleged to have suffered the conduct and is a little broader there. Now, I told you we we're going to talk about complaints by the Title IX coordinator um, as well. Uh, and there is a pretty specific process in the regulations about what happens when the Title IX and how the Title IX coordinator might get involved. So the Title IX coordinator um, must make a fact-specific determination about whether to initiate a complaint in the absence of a complaint, the withdrawal of any or all the allegations in a complaint, or the absence or termination of informal resolution. Got it. Now, to make that fact-specific determination, the regulations actually lay out eight factors. Now, these are not the only factors that need to be considered, but these are factors that have to go into this, this determination, this analysis by the Title IX coordinator. So those include the complainant's desires, right? What does the complainant want? Reasonable safety concerns about the with the complainant, the risk of additional acts of sex discrimination, the severity of the alleged discrimination, the age and relationship of the parties, the scope of the alleged sex discrimination, the availability of evidence, and whether the school could end the conduct and prevent its occurrence without initiating grievance procedures. Now, this, this concept has been around for, for some time, going back to even dear colleague letters about when the Title IX coordinator needs to make a complaint or initiate a grievance process. Um, but this is really one of the first times we've seen these specific factors um, laid out in regulation. And, and Scott, let me ask you, and I know we've talked about this a little in the first uh, session or module, and I know we're going to talk about it a little more today, but I mean, it, clearly the idea here is um, your Title IX coordinator is going to have to do a fair amount of assessment, right? I mean, before they could even uh, come to a conclusion on these eight factors, because there's a lot of information here that has to be obtained so that you can get there, right? I mean, you're talking about the complainant's desires, reasonable safety concerns. So these are these are not easy decisions to make out of the gate. Someone's going to have to really review the, the facts and circumstances uh of the matter is that fair to say fair to say and, and this goes part and parcel to the the heightened title IX coordinated responsibilities that that we discussed that are now part of the regulations so that as, as much as work as the title IX coordinators had before now it's specifically set out um in in regulation about what they're required um to do as part of any any complaint that they receive right um if you mind going to the next slide, Aaron. So just just to just to be clear though, considering the eight factors is not the end of the analysis. Um, they they still after this consideration too another another responsibility there. They may initiate the complaint if they determine the alleged conduct either presents an imminent or serious threat to the health and safety of the complainant, or that the conduct as alleged prevents the school from ensuring equal access on the basis of sex to its education program or activity. So, so again, another piece of the analysis for Title IX coordinators, they're going to have to understand and, and kind of make this, this determination. And these are not easy questions to answer. Um, if that determination is made, if a, uh, if a complaint moves forward, the Title IX coordinator is required to notify the complainant prior to initiating the complaint and address reasonable safety concerns about the complainant's safety and the safety of others. So, 
Getting to dismissal, um, another difference between these regulations and the 2020 version is that, as you'll see in the slide, there's no mandatory dismissal. All these bases, which look familiar um, and, and kind of are similar to what was in what was in current regulation or, or previous regulation, um, but are all optional for the Title IX coordinator to consider. And those those bases are the schools unable to identify the respondent following reasonable efforts to do so, the respondents not participating in the education program or activity, and it's not employed by the school. The complainant voluntarily withdraws some or all of the allegations, and the school determines that without those allegations, uh, the conduct alleged can't constitute sex discrimination, even if proved. And if the school determines the alleged conduct, even if proven, would not constitute sex discrimination under Title IX, uh, an important caveat in this in that last bucket, right, is that there's a responsibility to clarify with the complainant um, the the matter and the case um, before making that determination um, a reasonable effort to do so. And Scott, just to confirm, these are disjunctive, meaning that, you know, you wouldn't have to conclude that all of these things are true. You could elect to dismiss if you concluded that one of or more of these things was true. Absolutely correct. Okay. So what happens um, when we when, when a school dismisses a complaint? Um, so following dismissal, the school must notify the complainant of the dismissal. Um, there is a chance that only the complainant and not the respondent was notified, so that would be the end of the, the process there. If the respondent was notified of the complaint, they have to be notified of the dismissal as well. Uh, you must provide the parties with an opportunity to appeal, and we're going to discuss that in more detail toward the end of the presentation, but just put a pin in it that for a dismissal, there needs to be an appeal um, opportunity. Uh, supportive measures. So even if you're not going forward with the grievance procedure, a school must offer supportive measure to the complainant and the respondent if they were notified. Uh, and remedies in the school must ensure and continue to ensure um, that the Title IX coordinator takes other appropriate and prompt and effective steps to ensure sex discrimination does not continue or reoccur. And this, again, regardless of whether the complaint is, is dismissed as part of this grievance procedure, there's still that plenary obligation to kind of take those steps to ensure sex discrimination uh, doesn't continue or is prevented from occurring. Last, so consolidation of complaints. Um, and so schools that have gone through this process know that sometimes there are complaints with multiple respondents involved, multiple facts, that the regulations do provide an opportunity to consolidate under certain, excuse me, certain circumstances. So schools can consolidate complaints of sex discrimination against one or more respondent or by one or more complainant against another party when the allegations arise out of the same facts and circumstances. Um, and if one of the complaints um, to be consolidated is a complaint of sex-based harassment, right, and we're going to talk about in Module 3 the additional requirements that uh, schools must follow when addressing complaints of sex-based harassment that involved a student party, then the school's required to kind of follow the heightened procedures under 106.46, which we'll discuss in Module 3 for the adjudication of the entire consolidated complaint. All right, so... Have another question here to ask. I'm, I'm, if folks at home haven't uh, uh, figured this out yet, I'm the official question asker. That was one of the responsibilities I was given. Um, so I'm going to start here, Leah, with a question for you. And again, thank you for being here today and a part of this whole uh, uh, training series. So delighted. Um, so who is the respondent when the complainant alleges discrimination by the school? You know, that's such a good question, because with the expansion of this, these new regulations talking about sex discrimination, um, you may get complaints about sex discrimination on behalf of the school. Perhaps it's a complaint that one of your policies discriminates uh, on the basis of sex. So in those situations, there is no respondent. And I know that that gives some people heartburn because uh, so many of these requirements refer to the responsibilities uh, of notifying each party. Those just don't apply um, when you're addressing a complaint that alleges discrimination by the school. But you are going to continue with the grievance procedures in all other respects. So just no respondent. No one has the rights of the respondent in this case. Uh, but in all other respects, it's the same process. Got it. Um, Stephanie, question for you. Uh, do institutions have to change their policies as a supportive measure while the grievance procedure plays out? Erin, uh, no. Uh, schools... Uh, 
do not need to change policies um, as a supportive measure. But there may be times where policies do need to be modified and addressed um, after a determination is made. So while there's no requirement to change them as a supportive measure, after a determination, a reassessment of policies to making sure that um, you know, you're able to actually apply policies and adhere to them is something that might be needed. And you're going to continue with us, right? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. Right. So we are going um, to talk about the grievance process. Uh, the grievance process in the rule enumerates basic requirements um, that need to be followed. Um, first, there needs to be equitable treatment. So what that means is that treatment needs to be made equitably both between the complainant and the respondent. This is not the same thing as equal treatment, um, which I think is something that's important to note because there may be times where treatment is different for a complainant or respondent, um, but it is equitable in the sense that um, the way that, the way one thing um, may, something that may be needed for the complainant may be different for the respondent, and that's okay as long as it's equitable um, under the rule. Next um, is conflicts of interest. So there's a requirement that any person that's designated as the Title IX coordinator investigate um, investigator or decision maker not have any conflicts of interest or bias. This is something that's seen throughout the rule and is something that um, will come up again throughout our discussion and our presentation. Um, however, the decision maker may be the same person as the Title IX coordinator or the investigator. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later on as well um, in the single investigator model. There's also a presumption against responsibility. So there needs to include a presumption that the respondent is not responsible for the alleged conduct until a determination is reached. Um, this is something else that is a basic requirement that you cannot go into the grievance uh, process believing that a respondent is responsible for the conduct until there's a determination that's made. There's also a need to establish reasonably prompt timeframes for the major stages of the grievance procedures. Um, there's also the importance of uh, protection of privacy. Uh, and with that, that a school must take reasonable steps to protect the privacy of the parties and witnesses during the pendency of the school's grievance procedures. Um, but with that, the school cannot restrict a party's access to obtain evidence, to um, have conversations with an advocate or with family members. And uh, so while privacy is something that is certainly very important, um, being able to have conversations and have some information that's open is something that the rule contemplates as well. Um, the rule requires an objective evaluation of all relevant evidence and provides that credibility determinations are not based on status as a complainant, respondent, or witness. Um, so we'll discuss a bit more about this credibility determination piece in, in a moment, but um, that there needs to be some kind of evaluation of what is relevant and uh, whether witnesses do have credibility. And I'll, let me ask, I know, well, I know you're about to hit exclusion of impermissible evidence, but just as I'm reflecting on these and you're walking through and I'll ask, you know, you and open it up to the group here, but it seems to me like this framework is pretty similar to what a lot of schools were already contending with under the 2020 rule. And, and as a consequence, you know, to the extent you're having to modify or revise policies, you know, we would anticipate that hopefully many of your existing policies were already designed in a way to comply with most of these concepts, right? I mean, you know, conflict of interest, presumption against uh, responsibility, reasonable timeframes, those all are things I think that we've seen before. Is that fair? 
Absolutely. They all are. It's not a major departure um, from what we've previously seen. And they're all things that you likely are already doing. Um, and uh, just the way in which they're enumerated here just highlights uh, their continued importance. Yeah. So I cut you off before exclusion of impermissible, impermissible evidence. <laughs> one more to yeah, go. It, yeah, that's the last one. Uh, the last one uh, here on the slide is that as part of these um, basic requirements is the exclusion of impermissible evidence. Um, that is specific categories, which we'll discuss more in detail, um, that cannot be evidence uh, through the grievance process. So the rule discusses that there's four major stages. These stages are evaluation, investigation, determination, and appeal. Um, and they need to be done reasonably prompt. So reasonably prompt is not defined, um, but I think that we all can have a sense of what reasonably prompt means um, in that there can be no uh, undue delay and uh, that schools do have to take steps to make sure that uh, you're going through each of these major stages um, with, you know, some speed and deliberate uh, deliberateness. With reasonable promptness. Exactly, Aaron. Reasonable promptness. <laughs> so um, through the grievance process, uh, there is a notice requirement and the notice must be given to all known parties. The notice must include the school's grievance procedures as well as any informal resolution process. Uh, it must contain sufficient information to allow the parties to respond to the allegations. This is including the identities of the parties, the alleged sex discrimination, and the date and location of the alleged conduct um, to the extent that that's available. It may not be available, but the purpose of that is just to provide as much information as possible. Uh, there also must be a statement that retaliation is prohibited and a statement regarding access to the relevant and not otherwise impermissible evidence. Um, if during the investigation, the school decides to investigate additional allegations, it must provide the party with an up with all parties with an updated notice. And 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 I'll I'll just add, and I'm interested, Scott, uh, uh, what you and Leah think here. But you know, I think this is one of the trickier and harder things to do as an institution when you're actually implementing this. You know, it's easy to get those initial notices out of the gates. I think most folks get pretty conditioned to the idea that we've got a new matter that we've got to deal with, so we're going to provide some sort of initial notice of process and expectation uh, to complain and, and respond it. But it can be tricky as you move through the investigation and and new information comes up or new things. Things, uh, there are different developments to remember to always be getting those updated notices out to make sure that everybody has all of the relevant information. I mean, do you agree? Is that your experience? Thoughts for schools? 100% agree. <clears throat> yeah, no, I think that's a astute observation and it just really uh, underscores the need for your Title IX coordinators and whoever's managing your process to understand the um, what's happening, understand the requirements and and to to make sure that this is being followed. I'll also mention too as a preview for for module three um, coming up that the notice requirements are different for sex-based harassment. So it's even a little more confusing than that, Aaron. There's a little more process and schools might want to consider how the situations are different or whether to to um to kind of have identical ones just to kind of ease some of that administrative burden. Yep. Yeah, administrative burden is definitely uh, one of the challenges, I think, of all of this, uh, is trying to figure out how to manage it all. Um, uh, Stephanie, back to you, investigations. So we've got these notices, and uh, then we've got a framework for investigations as well, correct? It definitely. Yes, Aaron. Um, there's a requirement that investigations are um, adequate, impartial, and reliable. Um, and that requirement for that adequate, impartial, reliable investigation um, is also, there's a process that's outlined within the rule. Um, first, there's a burden of investigation and that during an investigation, school must ensure that the burden is on the school, that the burden is not on the parties um, and that the school has to gather the sufficient evidence for a determination. 
There's also an equal opportunity requirement um, in that the school must provide equal opportunity for parties to present relevant fact witnesses and other inculp inculpatory and exculpatory evidence. Um, we'll discuss both inculpatory and exculpatory evidence a bit more as well. Um, but what this is saying is that there has to be an equal opportunity for all parties to present both. Uh, evidentiary determinations are part of this framework too, and um, that there's a requirement to review all evidence and to determine what evidence is relevant and what evidence is impermissible regarding, uh, regardless of relevance. Um, so again, as we discussed before, there is evidence that is not permissible through uh, the grievance process, uh, but that all evidence does need to be reviewed in order to understand um, what can be included as part of the investigation. Additionally, there is a review of the evidence. So um, the there's a requirement that to provide each party with the relevant evidence uh, that's not impermissible um, or a description and a reasonable opportunity to respond. So what that is saying is there are either the evidence can be provided physically in copies or um, you can make it available for review or a description of what that evidence is can also be provided, um, but that either the description or the evidence itself does need to pr be presented to both parties for review. And finally, as we discussed a little bit earlier, credibility determinations is a part of the investigation process, um, and there needs to be a process that enables the decision maker to adequately assess credibility of parties and witnesses. So um, it is up to the decision maker to collect information or um, do whatever is within that process so that they're able to determine credibility. Yeah, Stephanie, and I'll, and I'll just add too, this has been something we've really been talking with institutions about that have a general kind of bifurcation of investigator investigates, provides a report to decision maker to decide. So just explaining this requirement, explaining that there, there's probably something more that needs to be done for the decision maker here to be able to assess that credibility and what process that looks like, depending on how the institution wants to run their process. I'll also just add, you know, we in 2020 um, had a couple of great folks from from the firm join us, uh, uh, Judge Shaw, Susan Lawrence, who talked about some of these concepts. I know we're going to get into it a little bit here, but we had, you know, even more discussion. They're veteran adjudicators and investigators, and they were talking about these ideas about credibility and, you know, evidentiary determinations, et cetera. And we do plan, just a reminder to folks who are watching, to do some best practices videos as a follow up to this four part training series. And this is the kind of thing we want to spend a little more time on. And we want to give you some folks who've really had to make these types of credibility determinations and, and give you an opportunity to hear them talk about how you might go about that. So please do keep a watch out for some of those best practice videos that are going to get into these nuanced uh, areas. And, and also, I think, give you some real practical uh, tips and understanding about how you can go about doing this in a, in again, a, a way that can be operationalized and carried out on a daily basis. So the investigator model, what do you think, Stephanie? Yeah. So this is a really interesting component of this rule um, that has differed from the previous rule, um, although it once was allowed and then it was then not allowed and now we're back to allowing it under this current rule. Um, so under the rule, it allows for a single individual to serve as the Title IX coordinator, the investigator and decision maker or any combination of the three. So um, there's no requirement that somebody is the investigator and that's their sole role is to uh, fact find and gather information. And then a different person is then making the decision. Instead here, uh, that person can be the same. And it's really um, up to the school to determine if that is the best approach for the school. However, um, there can be a lot of factors that go into whether or not that is the right approach. And there may be considerations such as uh, conflict of interest uh, issues or 
um, other bias issues unique to a school that might have a school consider that it's not the best option while weighing other factors such as just the size of an institution or the ability and um, of staff and personnel and other resources that may make it seem as though that is the best option for the school. Uh, and the rule really leaves that open to the school to decide which model they wanna do and, and what might make the most sense for them. Yeah. And it's it's worth just reminding folks, you, you know, I know there's been a lot of discussion and continue will always be a lot of discussion about the best way to manage um, allegations or complaints of sex based harassment. Just keep in mind, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about any complaint of sex based discrimination on campus. So, again, this could be a complaint involving unequal pay. Right. Based on based on sex. So this this concept of or, or this opportunity to have a, a single investigator model, we think a lot of schools will probably Probably find attractive, particularly when resolving complaints of that nature that, again, don't involve necessarily an allegation of sex-based harassment. Um, Scott, Stephanie, Leah, I, I assume schools are going to, there's some optionality here, right? And schools are going to have to decide what they want to do, but it certainly seems like, and I think we're experiencing in our conversations with clients, um, a, a desire to take advantage of this opportunity, particularly with regard to complaints that don't involve sex-based harassment, but involve uh, sort of other types of sex-based discrimination. Is that a fair, fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. We've, we've seen so many different, um, formulations of this and the conversations that we've had with clients recently. Um, and for them, it really has come down to their organizational structure um, and also what they've had in place. You know, if they have separate investigators and decision makers that are already kind of teed up, that right. are already employed there, know what they're doing. Um, a lot of them have decided to just continue that method. Um, but others that are smaller, like you said, are really trying to take advantage of this opportunity now, especially for those uh, a little bit less contentious uh, sex discrimination complaints. Right, exactly. So shifting gears a little bit, um, but talking still about uh, the grievance process and evidence. So we um, had mentioned earlier that relevancy and the issue of what is relevant uh, is something that is important under the rule. Um, the rule defines the term relevant as related to the allegations of sex discrimination under investigation as part of the grievance procedures. So it goes on to specifically discuss both questions and evidence and indicates that questions are relevant when they seek evidence that may aid in showing whether the alleged sex discrimination occurred. So um, certain questions can be asked and posed and they would be relevant, but that they're only relevant if they're seeking evidence that may aid in this investigation process and in showing, um, you know, whether there was sex discrimination. Additionally, evidence is relevant when it may aid a decision maker in determining whether the alleged sex discrimination occurred. And that's more in line with um, similarly what we've seen in court evidence or what you may have heard uh, elsewhere. That really aligns with the idea of what is relevant in terms of evidence in other aspects of the law um, and is looking, you know, to just, again, um, aid a decision maker in making a determination of whether there was sex discrimination. So I've got a question here. This one's for for Leah. Um, a scripted question. Uh, I, I'm full of unscripted questions as well today. Uh, how can an investigator summarize relevant evidence? Yeah, this is a great question about um, when you're providing the evidence. If you're summarizing it, what do you do at the end of an investigation? We get questions all the time about how do I talk about the evidence. Um, and so our recommendation are having a clear step of the clear record of the steps that you took during the investigation. This can also be really helpful if you're trying to explain um, any delay that happened during the investigation. As Stephanie mentioned, it has to be reasonably prompt, but there are times uh, that the investigation may need to be extended. So if you have a really good documentation of the steps that you took showing that you were actively pursuing this investigation, it just happened to take longer. Maybe there was 
a significant number of um, witnesses or uh, other evidence that you had to gather, that can be really helpful to have that record. Um, you should also consider summarizing the alleged incident, the parties involved, the witnesses that they identified, um, the key factual findings that were uncovered during the investigation, that relevant evidence, as Stephanie went through, of what is relevant, um, and then sp the specific policy that was alleged to have been violated under your specific school policy. Um, so let's turn to. I was going to um, say, uh, yeah, take us take us on into the evidence a little more. Yeah. So Stephanie had mentioned uh, the relevant but not impermissible evidence, and I'm sure your question that everyone was having is, well, what's impermissible? Um, so the per impermissible evidence is falls into three categories. We have privileged evidence, treatment records, and then the evidence related to the complainant's sexual interests or prior sexual conduct. So we're gonna take these one by one. So when talking about privileged evidence, evidence that is privileged is protected under a privilege as recognized by federal or state law, unless the person that holds that privilege has waived it under whatever procedure is applicable in your state. Um, so a lot of times you hear frequently, especially for us, we have attorney client privilege. So that would be something that would be protected and that would be impermissible evidence. If, you're, if one of your witnesses or one of your parties had spoken with their attorney about the case, you wouldn't be able to touch any of that evidence evidence unless they waived that um, in whatever your jurisdiction allows for waiving that privilege. Kind of in the same realm, we see a lot of protected documents related to medical records. So these records are impermissible if they are made or maintained by a physician, psychologist, or other recognized professional or paraprofessional para in connection with treatment for the party. So this is going to be really, really important, in, especially in cases of uh, sexual assault, other sexual violence. You're going to see treatment records come up frequently. Um, hopefully, a lot of these complainants are going and getting um, medical examinations afterward or going and seeing mental health professionals. Um, and so they that evidence is going to be really important. Um, but it is impermissible unless the person who holds that uh, privilege that uh, those records waives the, the privilege on those records. So if it's your complainant's medical records, they need to voluntarily written waive uh, their, their protection over those records for it to be used during the school's grievance process. And then finally, this is another hot button topic one that comes up so frequently in sex-based harassment complaints is uh, evidence that relates to the complainant's sexual interests or prior sexual conduct. That is impermissible. So let's start there. That is impermissible, but we do have some exceptions because of course we do, because nothing is ever simple. So <laughs> um, our exceptions here, we're saying no to any prior in any ev evidence of prior sexual interests or prior conduct unless um, it is used to prove that someone other than the respondent committed the conduct. So if you're talking about um, an alleged sexual assault that may have happened um, at a uh, fraternity house on campus, if you are using this to show that the complainant had prior sexual conduct uh, contact with um, another person that was also at that party, that could possibly be used to um, prove that someone other than the respondent in this case committed that alleged conduct. Um, it can also be used if it is um, used to show consent to the alleged sex-based harassment in this case um, based on prior specific incidents of complainants' prior sexual conduct with the respondent. So this is, again, really limited. You have to be looking at the prior sexual conduct between the two parties, so between the complainant and the respondent. The complainant's prior sexual conduct with other people who are not part of this complaint is not relevant. Um, it is not, it does not fall within this exception. But do keep in mind that the fact that of prior consensual sexual conduct between the two parties does not demonstrate or imply the complainant's consent to this specific alleged sexual conduct. Um, it's just evidence that can be used, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, and it doesn't uh, establish or preclude a determination that sex-based harassment occurred in this case. So, so Leah, this is, in my mind, tricky stuff. It's hard to yeah. keep in mind, you know, all these evidentiary rules, um, even as we know, as compared to, say, federal court, fairly simplified rules. It's still tricky business. How, how does, if you're a Title IX coordinator, you're, you're not a lawyer, maybe, uh, you know, how do you keep this in mind and, and really internalize this and execute on it 
as you're going about, you know, conducting assessments and investigations, and in some cases, maybe even determinations, right? I mean, what any practical advice for those, you know, Title IX coordinators out there in the world who are having to actually try to keep all this in mind as they're moving through these processes? Yeah, absolutely. It is it is tough. And I don't want anyone to feel like they're alone and feeling like it's tough. Even us as attorneys, it's tough to remember specific rules that apply to specific incidents. Um, so you're not alone in that. And it is new. Um, obviously, practice, practice, practice is going to help it kind of instill those in your brain. But also printing out things like these slides and pinning them yeah. to your court board behind your computer <laughs> can be really helpful as kind of a flow chart for you to look at as you're evaluating evidence. And remember that you have time. So when you're getting this evidence, you don't have to immediately exclude it, you have time to evaluate it, look at it, um, potentially contact maybe your uh, local counsel, or someone else. Um, if you're a deputy, Title IX coordinator, perhaps the Title IX coordinator that oversees the whole school can be helpful in making these determinations because they are complicated. Um, and we don't ever want anyone to feel overwhelmed in making them. They are difficult. Uh, but yeah, those can be helpful. Yeah. Practice. You're right. There's really no substitute for just over time. The, you just internalize the more you do it. So party access to the evidence, I believe Stephanie mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, so the school has two options of how it provides access to the evidence. You do have to provide access. You can either provide actual access, as Stephanie mentioned, that can be physical copies, that can be um, giving them a time and place where they can come and see it. That can also be what I see frequently in our day and age of the digital world is providing a PDF copy um, through OneDrive or something similar where you can limit the amount of time and the number of people who can access it. They can't download it, that sort of thing. Um, so that's an option as you provide access to the actual relevant and not otherwise impermissible evidence. The other option is providing an accurate description of the evidence with an equal opportunity to access it if anyone, any party asks for it. So both of these options result in potentially the parties having access to the evidence. We cannot prevent that. Um, but it's just kind of which way do you want to go? I've seen schools say, just go ahead and give, give them the evidence. They can ask for it anyway. Let's just go ahead and give it to them every time. I've seen other schools say, we're just going to provide a description of it. And if they ask for it, we'll make sure that that works for them. Um, but in either scenario, the parties have to be given the opportunity to respond to either that evidence or the description of the evidence uh, and provide that response as part of the investigation. Got it. And then after you complete your um your investigation, you get to your determination stage. Uh, so the determination stage has, as Stephanie went through all of these many different components that apply to all of these different stages, uh, the determination stage, the first one that we're going to look at is the evidentiary standard. Uh, so you're going to be using the preponderance of the evidence standard. And what we like to say is that's just slightly more likely that it happened than it did not. So that's, it's not even 51%, it's 50% in a featherweight. It is just slightly more likely than not. Uh, the only caveat to this is that you will not use the preponderance of the evidence standard uh, if you use the clear and convincing standard in other similar proceedings. So if your other discrimination complaints go through a process that uses the clear and convincing evidence standard, we really want to mirror that and make sure that you're providing uh, the same evidentiary standard in both of those. Then you're going to provide a notification of the determination to the parties of the outcome of the complaint uh, and the process for appeal, if applicable. Um, and we'll go through more of the appeal process later. Uh, then you're going to talk about the remediation. Uh, so that would be your outcomes. What are you going to provide to the parties that or to the complainant or any other person that was affected by the discrimination? So this is also a, an interesting little tidbit here is that you provide remedies not only for the complainant, the person who made the complaint that experienced the sex discrimination, but if someone else was affected by that sex discrimination, say you have a complaint, uh, as Aaron mentioned at the beginning, Maybe it's about a sports team that there was uh, discrimination. Maybe that uh, you know the soccer field wasn't uh, up. To, the women's soccer field wasn't up to par of the men's soccer field. Your remediation is going to, even though only one of the players may have actually made the complaint, you want to remediate with regards to all of the individuals who were affected. Um, and so that is a little bit that you need to pay attention here and look at, see who else was affected, and how can we provide some remediation for them as well. 
Interesting. So this this might uh, create an obligation to do some investigation. Uh, and by that, I just mean, you know, some effort to determine who else may have been impacted by the alleged misconduct. Right. I think that's a great point. And it's possible that your investigation may have already uncovered that, you know, in the in the case of uh, the soccer field, maybe you're meeting with some of these complainants uh, or these other individuals who are affected by the lack of facilities. Um, and maybe they can describe to you how it was how it affected them. Perhaps it's a little bit more obscure um, and that would be uncovered in your investigation. But if it's not, that's something that you do want to look at to make sure that you are adequately remediating the sex discrimination in the school. Yeah. And then you also always want to keep in mind that you need to follow your grievance process before imposing any disciplinary sanctions against a respondent. So this goes back to the presumption of non-responsibility that we want to make sure we're not presuming that the respondent is responsible at any point. We need to go through the full process, which means the appeal process as well. So this is something that I have seen uh, schools get uh, a little nervous about is that they have to wait through their whole appeal process to impose that discipline. But yeah. it is something that we need to make sure we're going through this grievance process uh, before making um, any kind of uh, imposing any disciplinary sanctions. But um you can impose disciplinary sanctions for false statements as long as false statements in the in the process of the investigation. So long as the discipline that you impose for those false statements is not solely based on the determination of whether sex discrimination occurred. So we're not saying this person must have lied because we found that the sex discrimination did not occur. So they must have lied during their investigative interview. And therefore, we're going to impose discipline on them. Um, you do not want to do that. So I would say tread carefully if you are imposing discipline for false statements. Yeah. And and Leah, can I ask you to just remind us, there's a little bit of a distinction here between sanctions and discipline uh, versus maybe emergency action or relief um, that might come up in the context of a complaint of sex uh, harassment, sex based harassment, for example, involving a student or otherwise, et cetera. Can you just give us a because I know we're going to talk about this at another point, but it seems like this is an important time to maybe re refresh our listeners that there is a distinction between discipline and sanctions on, on you know, at the uh, conclusion or near the conclusion of a process like this and sort of emergency measures you're taking to to stabilize a situation on campus. Yeah, definitely. The new regulations really took into consideration a lot of responses from schools talking about their desire, their need to establish safety for their campus, for the complainant. Um, and so it does contemplate these emergency removals and um, a placement on administrative leave for employees. And those can be implemented. They are not disciplinary sanctions. They are not intended to be disciplinary. So those don't, don't you don't have to wait until the end of your appeal process to impose right. those. Those can be during the pendency of the process and should be uh, if you think that they're necessary. Right. Very good. Thank you. On to credibility. So this is what uh, I think we touched on a little bit. If when credibility as, is at issue, this is a, a wrench that the department threw in here that makes it a little bit difficult if you're not using the single investigator model. So schools must provide a process that enables the decision maker to question parties and witnesses to adequately address their credibility to the extent credibility is both in dispute and is relevant to evaluating one or more allegations of sex discrimination. Um, and in my view, this is pretty much going to always be the case. You're pretty much always going to have a credibility dispute. It's going to, especially in in cases of sex-based harassment, credibility is going to be a major component. A lot of times these are, there are no witnesses. It is really, um, he, he said, she said, she said, she said, he said, he said, um, in evaluating these. So credibility is going to be a big component here. If you're using the single investigator model, your investigator is also your decision maker. So they are able to assess credibility during their investigation. If you are separating those processes, you need to make sure that your grievance process builds in a way for your decision maker to assess credibility. Um, a lot of times we've seen schools building in a, a kind of question as like a, a mini investigation process for the uh, decision maker to kind of talk, review the evidence and then talk to the parties and the witnesses briefly, not com completely rehashing everything, but just to satisfy themselves about the credibility issues um, that are relevant to the case. All right. Appeals. I actually think uh, this one's back to me. 
for for a second, and I'll I'll keep it brief. Um, just a couple of things to point out. What's interesting is uh, in the new rule, there is this idea of appeal being contemplated, but there's sort of an interesting line that's being drawn here. On the one hand, when you have a, a dismissal of a complaint, we talked a little bit about the circumstances pursuant to which you might uh, have a dismissal earlier in the presentation. In the context of a dismissal, there's a fair amount of discussion in the new rule about the type of policy that has to be provided. So if you look on your screen here, you'll see you know, dismissals may be appealed on the following bases. So the law has uh, our detail specific bases, right? Procedural regularity that would change the outcome. Uh, new evidence that would change the outcome and that was not reasonably available when the dismissal was made. And uh, the Title IX coordinator, investigator, decision maker had a conflict of interest or bias uh, for or against the complainants or respondents generally or the individual complainant or respondent that would change the outcome, right? Um, and by the way, these are pretty common bases uh, for an appeal in a lot of different circumstances and a lot of different proceedings. Um, the parties must be provided a reasonable and equal opportunity to make a statement in support of challenging the outcome or the dismissal, right? Um, when a complaint is dismissed, a school must, at a minimum, and again, this is set out in the law, offer supportive measures to the complainant as appropriate. Uh, if the respondent has been respondent has been notified of the allegations, offer supportive measures to the respondent as appropriate. And keep in mind that's conjunctive. So the expectation is at a minimum, you'll offer all of these services, take other prompt and effective steps as appropriate, a lot of as appropriates, um, through the Title IX coordinator to ensure that sex discrimination does not continue to recur within the school's education program or activity. So again, you do have this opportunity to dismiss complaints, um, but if you uh, are in the process of dismissing a complaint, uh, you have to make sure, one, uh, uh, first of all, that it's being done appropriate, uh, pursuant to the appropriate bases, and second of all, that you take these additional steps. What's interesting is there is not as much discussion around dismissal uh, as a consequence of a determination, right? Uh, or appeals rather, excuse me, at the uh, as a consequence of a determination. So, you know, this first couple of slides, we talk about the law has this particular process and expectation if uh, in the context of an appeal pursuant to a dismissal. And now we're talking about, well, what if you actually run to the end of the process and you have a determination? Is there an appeal right? And all the law really talks about in this instance is that schools have to offer the parties an appeal process that, quote, at a minimum is the same as it offers in all other comparable proceedings, if any, including proceedings relating to other discrimination and complaints. So, Lee, I'm going to ask you a question here, and then I'll, uh, as always, open it up to others. Um, but, you know, the question is, how do you even determine if you've got comp other comparable proceedings? I guess maybe if you have student grievance processes unrelated to sex discrimination, how do you manage the, the, the sort of dichotomy here among the different types of appeal rights and operationalize in particular this second concept where you have an appeal in the context of a determination, right? Um, but not a lot of structure in the new Title IX rule around what you're supposed to do. Yeah, that was a very long question. <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. This is another area where you get a lot of uh, leeway. And in some ways that makes it a little bit more difficult. I think the department was trying to give us a bone here, but really it makes us uh, have a little bit of uh, extra decision points. You can just use a process that you already have in place for other types of discrimination complaints. That would certainly be compliant here um, in order to make it easier and maybe more administratively feasible for uh, the people on your campuses. I would mirror a lot of the same, use the same uh, elements from the appeal of a dismissal to guide your appeal of determination. Um, again, you have to make sure that you're offering at least at the minimum the same level of process that is offered under uh, comparable proceedings. So you want to review those policies absolutely to make sure that the process that you have crafted specifically for Title IX appeals um, is at a minimum the same as those, um, but you can also add more in order to make sure that it's compliant um, and make sure and, and have it track with the appeal of dismissals just for a little bit more ease. And but and and Scott, I'll throw this one to you, but just to be clear, if 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 my comparable processes have no appeal right, I would not be obligated to include an appeal right. Is that is that correct? Correct, <laughs> but but certainly we would never recommend ending this procedure without an appeal right. Understood, the, understood. The, Fair the, point. The, the takeaway, right, should be uh, 
totally sign on exactly everything that that Leah said about kind of how to go about and assess it, but but having a justifiable and defensible appeal process right. is important. Yep. Very good. Stephanie, further thoughts? I really think Scott and Leah have, have covered most <laughs> of it. Um, I, I guess I'll reiterate that looking at the policies that you currently have in place and making sure you're familiar with all of those policies, even outside of Title IX, uh, just can be an important, helpful guide. Yeah. And I'll I'll add to that. That's a great point. And I'll actually just emphasize here, you know, one of the great challenges that institutions have on an ongoing basis is just the reconciliation of policies. Right. I mean, there's so many different areas now in which you're supposed to have policies across your entire campus. But even in the realm of, you know, sex discrimination, human resources, uh, grievance complaints by students and employees, you, you probably have lots of em- uh, uh, policies in place if you're a large university system across multiple schools even and and you know new laws come along you've got new uh, faculty and staff and positions and people add to these policies and and even when sometimes they were reconciled they cease to be reconciled you know one th- thing um i know this regulatory whiplash with uh you know the title nine concepts being revisited every three or four years is challenging on institutions i mean the one silver lining here is as you go to implement this 2024 rule um it does give you an opportunity to as stephanie and everyone else has mentioned to go back and look at all of those policies and just make sure that they're harmonized um because we see situations all the time where someone writes this new beautiful updated 2024 title nine policy and it does not reconcile with what's in the annual security report or the faculty handbook or the student handbook etc so you know if nothing else use this as an opportunity to kick the tires on all of those other policies and just make sure that that everything harmonizes. I'll also suggest just as a tactical uh, move to try to only have these policies in one place if you can. Cross-references can be your friend because if you're reprinting these over and over in different places, then what happens is you update one and the other doesn't get updated. But if they all sort of point to one place where the policy is actually set out, it actually can make it functionally, tactically a little easier to keep everything reconciled. So just a little advice from a bunch of lawyers. Um, Serving impartially. So we're coming coming to the end here, our last sort of segment of today's uh, module. Serving impartially. So we have kind of discussed at various points of the requirements of serving impartially, and we have mentioned how that was something that was a component under the 2020 rules as well. So we've outlined some key concepts here for you uh, of of serving impartially. So you want to treat complainants and respondents equitably. uh, And Stephanie had really great points about the difference between equitable and equal. So keep those in mind. It doesn't have to be equal, but just equitable. Understand the presumption that the respondent is not responsible for responsible for the alleged conduct. This is really important and really key in a lot of these grievance processes and was a really big component of the 2020 rules. They have clear, clearly shown that they wanted to keep for the 2024 rules is that presumption of non-responsibility. So make sure that you keep that in mind throughout the process. Um, understanding the standard of evidence, as we discussed, either the preponderance of the evidence or the clear and convincing evidence standard, understanding what that means um, and understanding when you've reached it is very important. Um, And then do not allow, rely upon, or otherwise use impermissible evidence. Remember what those three categories of impermissible evidence are. Print them out, stick them to your whiteboard, um, love them, live them, uh, keep them in your mind, and do not rely upon them uh, unless you have a consent or a waiver as needed for the various components. The title the the title nine coordinator investigators and decision makers also must not have a conflict of interest or a bias for or against complainants or respondents generally or an individual complainant or respondent so what this means is no conflict of interest i think we all know what that means that means um if you know say one of the complainants is your your daughter, your son or daughter, you would not want to be involved in that case, right? Um, and then a bias for or against complainants or respondents generally, this could go back to your personal history. Say that you have experienced um, sex discrimination or sex-based harassment in your own life. You might have an internal bias uh, against respondents generally. And so that may mean that you're not the right person to 
uh, handle these complaints. And that's okay. And that is something that you need to uh, kind of look internally and decide for yourself. The only person that can know is you, but we want to make sure that we are addressing those head on. Um, and then again, of course, if you have a bias for or against an individual complainant or respondent. So say um, you're in a smaller school and maybe you're both a professor and the Title IX coordinator or the investigator or the decision maker, um, perhaps you may not want to uh, be that role if you are handling a complaint that is filed uh, by or against one of your students, particularly um, if you have a close relationship with that student. Um, it, you may have a bias for or against them, depending on the, how they act in your class, um, that you want to address and make sure that you are handling before the process starts um, to make sure that you're serving impartially. Yeah. And Lee, I'm going to ask you a really hard question here. But I think it's an important one that pops to my mind immediately every time I hear a conversation on this topic. But you mentioned smaller schools, you know, particularly in the smaller school setting. I mean, it's one thing if you have students, but, you know, there may only be 50 or 100 faculty, staff and employees and your Title IX coordinator may know everyone on that campus and may even know most people fairly well. You know, how does a school in that type of situation, you know, and a Title IX coordinator in that type of situation go about getting comfortable with the fact that they don't have a conflict of interest? And, you know, does it just put schools at some risk that are smaller that someone could always object on that grounds? Yeah, I think I think it is a risk. Um, just knowing someone does not mean that you have a bias or conflict of interest off the bat, right? Um, it has to be something more than just knowing them, seeing them in the hallway, that sort of thing. Obviously, it's going to be a spectrum. So if you see them outside of school, they're coming over on the weekend to barbecue, that might be uh, moving into the uh, the non-impartial category there. Yeah. But then there's also the option of if you really do think that there is a conflict of interest here, there is nothing to preclude your school from outsourcing the investigation or the decision process to um, a, an external law firm. There are other firms that investigate and do this kind of thing, um, specifically in cases of conflicts of interest. Yep. So that can be particularly important and something that smaller schools can consider doing. I I've heard about schools, uh, uh, consortiums of Title IX coordinators and things like that, too, among schools um, to sort of try to solve this potential issue. But, yeah, it can be a sticky wicket. It really can be, particularly for smaller institutions. So then for decision makers, the their serving impartially requirements are objectively evaluating all relevant evidence, including both the inculpatory and exculpatory evidence. Um, and they also must ensure that credibility determinations are not based on a person's status as a complainant, respondent, or witness. So this again goes back to a bias for or against respondents or complainants generally. You want to make sure that you're not just saying that the complainant is or is not credible because they are the complainant or that the respondent is or is not credible because they are the respondent. You need to be evaluating each person and each person's credibility on an individualized basis. All right. So I've got a question here for Stephanie. What is inculpatory and exculpatory evidence? Yes. Besides being kind of hard to say, um, <laughs> inculpatory evidence shows or tends to show uh, a respondent's responsibility. So it's something um, that is going to show um, whether or not somebody did do something. Exculpatory, on the other hand, is evidence that shows or tends to show the respondent is not responsible. So um, kind of looking exactly at the words you have in, showing that somebody is responsible, and then X, showing that they're not responsible. So that's one way to Got think it. about it. And yeah, consider. I like that. I've never, I've actually never thought of the N and X before. That's that's very helpful. Um all right. Another question. I got one for Lee. I think we've got three in a row here at the end so we can get uh, a little more from everyone. How can someone serve without bias or conflict of interest? And you were speaking of this just a minute ago. Yeah, there's the various things that we've talked about so far. Avoid that prejudgment of facts at issue. I know it can be really tempting. You get the complaint and you only have the complainant side. And of course, you're looking at it and you're going, this is real bad. Yep. It, you know, where we've decided here. Avoid that. All Keep in mind that you only have the complainant side at one point. After each investigative interview, it can also be tempting. Now you've heard the other side story. And so, you know, you're pushed to their side after, you know, the the 
uh, recency effect of I've recently heard their side, so I believe their side. Try to uh, acknowledge that whenever you encounter it um, and to keep yourself from prejudging the facts at issue, the parties, the witnesses. Um, again, avoid inferences based on party status, avoid sex stereotypes. This can come up frequently uh, in many different ways, but it, to ensure that you're serving impartially, you want to um, acknowledge those sex stereotypes and make sure that you're not including them in any of your uh, actions. Great. And Scott, I think this is our last uh, substance slide uh, of the presentation. How can a school ensure that its Title IX team remains free of bias and conflict of interest? I'm honored to take the last one. Um, we have a couple, couple thoughts, right? So adequate training and understanding of bias and conflict of interest. So that's part of the requirements of the, the regulation, but certainly we'd, we'd encourage the you guys take that seriously, make sure that everyone understands those pieces, understands when a conflict of interest or bias might occur, as, as Leo was saying, versus just, I've had them in class or something like that, or yeah. kind of the, the, the difference there. And that's, that's a very important difference. Don't penalize someone for disclosing a conflict of interest. Encourage it. Do whatever you can to kind of bring that out. You want to bring that out at the very beginning. So when you're when you're providing um, the, the, the names of someone before even evidence is out, maybe send a poll around to say, do you know this person? Do you have any connection? And have a conversation maybe with the Title IX coordinator about your potential investigators and decision makers and things like that to make sure that the relationships, if, if they do know these people, are are innocuous or wouldn't rise to the level of a conflict or bias and establish a process to review and evaluate, right? So when someone does say, yes, I know this person, what are the criteria you're going to use to make that determination? And I'll certainly guarantee if you want that information to come out at the beginning, even though it's annoying to kind of have to go and find another investigator or decision maker, if this does go to litigation, I will guarantee there is a lot of questions in that person's deposition about whether they have a conflict of interest or bias. And if you're figuring that out the first time at that stage, that's not the best thing. So try and draw that information out at the earliest stage you can. Thank you, sir. All right, just a few notes here at the end of the presentation. You've made it most of the way. Give us another five minutes and you're uh, you're free to go get that cup of coffee or do whatever else you were going to do this afternoon. So we do want to highlight for you the Office of Civil Rights uh, of the U.S. Department of Education has a number of resources that it has made available. These will be things that you want to review um, in the case of the fact sheet, the summary of key provisions, uh, resource for drafting policies. These are all uh, documents that the department has made available that you can review that talk about the new rule and give you um, some quick uh, uh, notes about it and also highlight the department's perspective with regard to this rule, which is critically important to keep in mind. Um, there's also the policy guidance portal, and we suggest that folks keep an eye on that throughout. A lot of these documents are at the portal, and we anticipate that additional documentation will be posted there in the future. I also want to highlight our TC extra credit. Uh, first of all, please check out, we've got our QR code right here. If you scan that with your phone, it will take you to our higher education resources page. We got smart a couple of years ago. Everything that we're producing is on that page. That includes white papers, our blog posts, um, our webinars, and our training series. And we're actually going to create a new category on that page. It should be there now. That includes the slides for this training series um, and any other materials we put out that relate to Title IX and sort of the compliance with the Title IX rule. So please, please, please check that out. We've made that all available uh, and we would love for you to have all of those resources. Um, I mentioned earlier that includes the webinars and training series that sit on YouTube. By the way, you can also go to the Thompson Coburn YouTube page. Um, we do have compliance materials I mentioned, and that's like our white papers. We, we do fairly lengthy, detailed analyses, and typically they're designed to be like tools that you could use. So these are desk guides that, that serve a practical purpose in helping you comply with certain uh, regulatory obligations obligations, whether that be Title IX or Title IV or some other departmental rule. And finally, again, our blog where uh, Scott and Stephanie and Leah and others frequently uh, write short articles and updates and things of that nature. Um, just a quick disclaimer, reminder, we are not your lawyers unless we are your lawyers and everything here was provided for the purpose of information. By the way, I'll also highlight, if you go to the slides for the presentation, there are uh, more extended professional profiles for everybody who you've heard speak today, as well as contact information. Um, thank you so much for joining. We hope you enjoyed the first module and the second module. We hope you'll tune in for the third and fourth. Keep an eye out for those best practices uh, presentations as well. Uh, and until next time, I'll just say on behalf of all of us, be well. Mm -hmm.